don't think so. I think we don't need to leave. We won't have them That might be a good reason for me to go. We have I'll go with you. you. Oh, I'm yeah, with you. Right. Yeah, I sure will. You can take me too, Jeff. Roll.
Yes, yes. Did you have your volume off? Everything's been off, yeah. I haven't even turned them on until right now I came and asked you uh, if it was okay if okay. I could put them on. And yeah. then I can I can unplug everything from my camera. Okay, good. You're not conversation or don't
what's charged. Yes. Does the state have any objections to it? No. Has the defense had an opportunity to review the, the, uh, the uh, court's charge? We have not. Do you have any objections to the court's charge? No, ma'am. We, we uh, have no objection to the charges written. All right. Are both sides ready to proceed with the closing arguments? Yes, sir. Yes, Judge, we had this issue we wanted to bring up. Yes, that's correct. So I wanted to make sure that we're all ready to... Oh, yeah, we're to subject to that. We're ready. I am. We are. Okay. All right. Um, and this is this does not need to be um, broadcast by the media. We have a juror...
Individual means a human being who is alive. Deadly weapon means a firearm or anything manifestly designed, made, or adapted for the purpose of inflicting death or serious bodily injury, or anything that in the manner of its use or intended use is capable of causing death or serious bodily injury. Firearm means any device designed, made, or adapted to expel a projective through a barrel by using the energy generated by an explosion or burning substance or any device readily convertible to that use. Mental state definitions. A person acts intentionally or with intent with respect to a result of his conduct when it is when it is his conscious objective or desire to cause the result. A person acts knowingly or with knowledge with respect to a result of his conduct when he is aware that his conduct is reasonably certain to cause the result. A person acts recklessly or is reckless with respect to the result of his conduct when he is aware of but consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result will occur. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all circumstances as viewed from the actor's standpoint. A person acts with criminal negligence or is criminally negligent with respect to the result of his conduct when he ought to be aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that the result complained of will occur. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that the failure to perceive it constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care that an ordinary person would exercise under all the circumstances as viewed from the standpoint of the person charged. Capital murder. Now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Nestor Fernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October, A.D. 2022, in Dallas County, Texas, intentionally or knowingly caused the death of Jacqueline Pakua, an individual, by shooting Jacqueline Pakua with a firearm, a deadly weapon, and during the same criminal transaction, said defendant did then, then and there intentionally or knowingly cause the death of Katie Flowers, an individual, by shooting Katie Flowers with a firearm or a deadly weapon. Or, the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October 2022 in Dallas County, Texas, intentionally or knowingly caused the death of Jacqueline Pakua, an individual, by shooting Jacqueline Pakua, <coughs> with a firearm, a deadly weapon, and during a different criminal transaction, but pursuant to the same scheme and cause of uh, conduct, said defendant did then and there intentionally or knowingly cause the death of Katie Flowers, an individual, by shooting Katie Flowers with a firearm, a deadly weapon, then you will find the defendant guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment. But if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of capital murder as alleged in the indictment to say by your verdict, not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of murder of Jacqueline Pakua as included in the indictment and outlined below. Lesser included offense of murder, Jacqueline Pakua. Now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October 2022 in the county of, Dallas, uh, county of Dallas, state of Texas, intentionally or knowingly caused the death of an individual, Jacqueline Pakua, the deceased, by shooting the deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon, then you will find the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, guilty of murder of Jacqueline Pakua, as included in the indictment. But if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of murder of Jacqueline Pakua, as included in the, in, the, in the indictment, to say by your verdict, not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of murder of Katie Flowers, as included in the indictment and outlined below. 
lesser included offense of murder, Katie Flowers. Now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October 2022 in the county of Dallas, state of Texas, intentionally or knowingly caused the death of an individual, Katie Flowers, the deceased, by shooting the deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon, then you will find the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, guilty of murder of Katie Flowers as included in the indictment. But if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of the murder of Katie Flowers as included in the, in the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter of Jackie Pakua as included in the indictment and outlined in the letter. Lesser included offense of manslaughter Jacqueline Pacula. You are instructed that a person commits the offense of manslaughter if he recklessly causes the death of an individual. <clears throat> now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October, 2022, did recklessly cause the death of an individual, namely Jacqueline Pacula, the deceased, by shooting the deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon, they will find the defendant guilty of manslaughter as included in the indictment. But if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of the manslaughter of Jackie Pacua as included in the, in the indictment to say by your verdict, not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter of Katie Flowers as included in the indictment and outlined below. Lesser included offense of manslaughter, 80 flowers. Now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October, 2022, did recklessly cause the death of an individual, namely Katie Flowers, the deceased, by shooting the deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon, then you will find the defendant guilty of manslaughter as included in the indictment. But if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of manslaughter of Katie Flowers as included in the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide of Jackie Pakua as included in the indictment and in outline below. Lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide. Jacqueline Pakua. You are instructed that a person commits an offense of criminally negligent homicide if he causes the death of an individual by criminal negligence, as that term has been defined. Now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October, 2022, did cause the death of an individual, namely Jacqueline Pacua, the deceased, by criminal negligence, then you will find the defendant guilty of criminally negligent homicide as included in the indictment. But if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of the offense of, crim of the criminally negligent homicide of Jacqueline Pacua, as included in, in the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of the lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide of Katie Flowers, as included in the indictment, and I outline the letter. Lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide, Katie Flowers. Now, bearing in mind the foregoing instructions, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant Nestor Hernandez, on or about the 22nd day of October, 2022, did cause the death of an individual, namely Katie Flowers, the deceased, by criminal negligence, then you will find the defendant guilty of criminally negligent homicide as included in the indictment. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of either capital murder or the murder of Jacqueline McCoy, or the murder of Katie Flowers, 
which you have a reasonable doubt as to which of said offenses he is guilty, then you must resolve that doubt in the defendant's favor and find him guilty of the lesser included offense of murder of either Jacqueline Pukua or Katie Flowers. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of either the murder of Jacqueline Pukua or the murder of Katie Flowers or manslaughter of Jacqueline Pukua or manslaughter of Katie Flowers, but you have a reasonable doubt as to which of set offenses he is guilty, then you must resolve that doubt in the defendant's favor and find him guilty of the lesser offense of manslaughter of either Jacqueline Pukua or Katie Flowers. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of either manslaughter of Jacqueline Pukua or manslaughter of Katie Flowers, or criminally negligent homicide of Jacqueline Pukua, or criminally negligent homicide of Katie Flowers, <coughs> which you have a reasonable doubt as to which of said offenses he is guilty, then you must resolve that doubt in the defendant's favor and find him guilty of the lesser offense of criminally negligent homicide of either Jacqueline Pukua or Katie Flowers. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of either capital murder, murder of Jacqueline Pukua, or murder of Katie Flowers, manslaughter of Jacqueline Pukua, or manslaughter of Katie Flowers, or criminally negligent homicide of Jacqueline Pukua, or criminally <coughs> negligent homicide of Katie Flowers, but you have a reasonable doubt as to which of said offenses he is guilty then you must resolve that doubt in the defendant's favor and find him guilty of the lesser offense of criminally negligent homicide of either Jacqueline Pukua or Katie Flowers. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant is guilty of any offense <coughs> that is his charge, then you will acquit the defendant and say by your verdict, not guilty. Indictment. An indictment is the means whereby a defendant is brought to trial in a felony prosecution. It is not evidence of guilt, nor can it be considered by you in passing upon the question of guilt of the defendant. The fact that a person has been arrested, confined, indicted for, or otherwise charged with an offense does not give rise to any inference of guilt in the trial. Presumption of innocence. All persons are presumed to be innocent, and no person may be convicted of, of an offense unless each element of the offense is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The law does not require a defendant to prove his innocence or produce any evidence at all. The presumption of innocence alone is sufficient to acquit the defendant unless the jurors are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt after careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence in the case. <coughs> Burden of proof. The prosecution has the burden of proving the defendant guilty, and it must do so by, by proving each and every element of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt. And if it fails to do so, you must acquit the defendant. The burden of proof in all criminal cases rests upon the state throughout the trial and never shifts to the defendant. It is not required that the prosecution prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. It is required that the prosecution's proof excludes all reasonable doubts concerning the defendant's guilt. In the event that you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt, after considering all the evidence before you and these instructions, you will acquit him and say by your verdict, not guilty. Evidentially instructions. You are instructed that if there is any evidence before you in this case regarding the defendant's having committed any offense other than the offense alleged against him in the indictment in this case, you cannot consider said evidence for any purpose unless you find beyond a reasonable, find and believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed such other offense, if any. Even then, you may only consider the same in determining the state of mind of the defendant motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake or accident of the defendant, if any, in connection with the offense alleged against him in this indictment. You are instructed that certain evidence was admitted in evidence before you in regard to the defendant's having been charged and convicted of offenses other than the one for which he is now on trial. 
Such evidence cannot be considered by you against the defendant as any evidence of guilt in this case. Said evidence was admitted before you for the purpose of aiding you, if it does, in passing upon the weight you will give his testimony, and you will not consider the same for any other purpose. At times throughout the trial, the court has been called upon to pass on the question of whether or not certain evidence might properly be admitted. You are not to be concerned with the reasons for such rulings, and are not to draw any inferences from them. Whether offered evidence is admissible is purely a question of law. In admitting evidence to which an objection is made, the court neither determines what weight should be given such evidence, nor passes on the credibility of the case. <coughs> As to any offer of evidence that has been rejected by the court, you, of course, must not consider saying. As to any question to which an objection was sustained, you must not conjecture as to what the answer might have been or as to the reason for the objection. You are the exclusive judges of the facts proved, the credibility of the witnesses, and the weight to be given the testimony. However, you must receive and follow the law provided to you by the court. You are instructed that you may consider all relevant facts and circumstances surrounding the death, if any, and the previous relationship existing between the accused and the deceased, together with all relevant facts and circumstances, going to show the condition of the mind of the accused at the time of the offense, if any. Deliberation instructions. After you retire to the jury room, you should select one of your members as your presiding juror. It is his or her duty to preside at your deliberations, vote with you, and when you have unanimously agreed upon a verdict, to certify to your verdict by using the appropriate form attached to your two and signing the same as presiding juror. Your verdict must be unanimous. It shall be arrived at by due deliberations and not by majority vote or any method or chance. It is only from the witness stand that the jury is permitted to receive evidence regarding the case and no juror is permitted to communicate to any other juror anything he or she may have heard regarding the case from any source other than the witness stand. You are instructed that any statements of counsel made during the course of the trial or during argument not supported by the evidence or statements of law made by counsel not in harmony with the laws as stated to you by the court in these instructions are to be wholly disregarded. During your deliberations in this case, you must not consider, discuss, nor relate any matters not in evidence before you. You should not consider nor mention any personal knowledge or information you may have about any fact or person connected with this case which is not shown by the evidence. During your deliberations, you are also instructed you must not communicate with or provide any information to anyone by any means about this case. You may not use any electronic device or media, such as telephone, cell phone, smartphone, iPhone or computer, the internet, any internet service or any text or instant messaging service, or any internet chat room, blog or website, such as Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok or Twitter, to communicate to anyone any information about this case or conduct any research about this case until I accept your verdict, if any. After you have retired to consider your verdict, no one has any authority to communicate with you except the bailiff who has you in charge. You may communicate with this court in writing, in writing, signed by your presiding juror, through the bailiff who has you in his charge, his or her charge. Do not attempt to talk to the bailiff, the attorneys, or the court concerning any questions you may have. Your sole duty at this time is to determine the guilt or innocence of the defendant under the indictment in this cause and restrict your deliberations solely to the issue of guilt or innocence of the defendant. If you have a verdict or if you wish to have a break, turn on the red light and the bailiff will quickly respond. And this is signed by me, Judge Chica Anu, Criminal District Court No. 7. And on the back of the instructions, you have the verdict forms, and I'm going to read them out to you. All right, the first one, the State of Texas versus Nestor Hernandez. We, the jury, 
you unanimously find the defendant guilty of the offense of capital murder as charged in the indictment. Presiding juror's signature, presiding juror's printed name. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of murder of Jacqueline Pakua as included in the indictment. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding juror. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of murder of Katie Flowers as included in the indictment. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding juror. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter of Jacqueline Pakua as included in the indictment. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding juror. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter of Katie Flowers as included in the indictment. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding juror. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty of the, of the lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide of Jacqueline Pakua as included in the indictment. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding juror. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of criminally negligent homicide of Katie Flowers as included in the indictment. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding, presiding juror. Or, we the jury unanimously find the defendant not guilty. Signed by the presiding juror, printed name of the presiding juror. Now, as I said, I'll give you this charge so you can refer to it. I know that there's a lot in there, but it will guide you. If you need to refer to it, please do so. Well, you do. <clears throat> Having read the charge, is the state of Texas ready to proceed with those numbers? I am, but I need to ask if we can approach you for literally five seconds. Yes, Good morning. Good morning. We started Monday. We started talking about some very important things. I'm going to run through them and then we get to the facts of this case and why we're here and what this case is. Okay? We came here and we thank you for coming. We thank you for responding to the summons. Many, many summonses go out and very few show up. But we also gave you an oath and we went over that and made certain that you understood that your oath in talking to us was very special because we're Americans and this is how our system is built. And then I told you that the judge would have you stand up when we started this phase of the case and give you another oath that you will the true verdict render according to the law and the evidence said, hope you got it. And we have here, the law is written and the evidence, obviously, that you are to consider <coughs> came from this witness stand or, or off of that screen or in documents or whatever. That's the evidence that you are to use and nothing else. Okay? We talked about capital murder, and we talked about the law surrounding that in the two different ways, at least, that we posted up for this particular case, that capital murder can be committed. Okay? The defense talked about murder as a lesser-included offense, but we focused on what was in the indictment. Okay? The judge has given you some instructions, and I want to talk about some of these because, first of all, as we said, this is the law. And on page four, after your consideration of whether or not we prove capital murder beyond a reasonable doubt, or the evidence proved it beyond a reasonable doubt, it says, that, but if you do not so believe, or if you have a reasonable doubt thereof, you will acquit the defendant of capital murder, as alleged in the indictment, say by your verdict not guilty, and proceed to consider whether the defendant is guilty of a lesser included offense. And it goes on and on each page. Okay? My suggestion is you'll never get past that, based on the evidence. 
I want to go back and read another section of the evidence that the judge uh, put in the charge, and I want to remind you of your responsibility. I want to remind you that one of the things that I told you that was so unique and special about us and what we do in criminal trials in the United States of America is that we put you in charge of what the outcome is. And the judge has told you that again. I went over it on Monday. I don't want to remind you because you do have conflicting testimony in this case, no question about it. Okay, but what does it say on page 13? You're the exclusive judges of the facts prove the credibility of the witnesses and the way to be given to the testimony. And I think you remember, out of all of what might be in here, that I spent some time on that on Monday for a reason. Because one thing we can't control <coughs> is whether someone wants to testify and what they will say. And I want to talk to you now about why this is just one offense and one offense only. And that's capital murder. I want to remind you all about our setting. And I don't mean here in this sterile courtroom. I mean over at the Shingle Tower at Methodist Hospital on the floor where moms and babies reside for a short period of time. Moms who deliver naturally or C-sections or whatever. But especially C-sections. You ain't walking out of there the next day right away. There are people who go there and attend to that. But somewhere you've heard from the evidence in this case, and it's probably true in every room there, that a mom and a baby together. There's a point after the birth of a child where we all, as parents, we take a moment. And it's certainly a reasonable inference and deduction from the evidence, the moments from which you've heard how she treated that baby. That there's a moment where you look into your newborn's eyes, especially the first one, and you see love like you'll never see it before. You see wonderment like you'll never experience. And your wish is for everything to come out with. Unfortunately, part of that involves who the dad is. And that's why we're here, regardless. You have a staff who works there, social workers who come in and tend to the need for the mother and the baby at that moment and work for the reason for their future. You have nurses who come in and make sure, especially that C-section mom, is not suffering from infections or this or that or the other, not having complications, so they can do what? Move them on home with the baby and so they can continue to live their lives. And that's what was going on. We had people attending to the business of a new life. We had a mom who was there about her newborn. And all the staff was there to make certain that the new little lives come in and are protected. The only problem, and the problem that brings us here today, is there was another life walking around that made its way into the Schenkel Tower Methodist Hospital to the floor, confused, you know now on that. Goes into the wrong room. Can't get that figured out. You heard David Lopez's description of that. Finally winds up. What's walking around? That love for that baby? No. Rage, resentment, anger, and a plan to kill. Based on the believable and credible evidence of this case and what you've heard and seen was walking around, masquerading, going into that building as a caring, loving father coming in to see his child and tend to the mother. But you know that's not true by his own admission. He was full of anger and rage. And certainly the evidence shows that. What, what do you know? First of all, Selena, she knew exactly what was up. She covered her head up quick, whether it's alcohol or meth or whatever, intoxicated, out of control. Mix that into that stimulant that the doctor told you, and the doctor told you the kinds of things that can happen generally to personalities, and you listen to her description of him, you listen to that audio and that, see that video, you hear what he said, what he screamed back out of there, and his constant screaming, 
His body has been taken out of that room across a woman's dead body and he shot her in the head. And the only thing coming out of his mouth is what? She cheated on me. It's the only concern. Why? Because he's executing his plan to come there and kill. Press the button. Get somebody in. I'm going to kill somebody. I don't know if you caught this, but there was a one person that went in there first before Miss Jackie went in there. And you got to think, that person that went in and walked out with him in that room with a pistol, that's the luckiest person in Dallas County on that day. She got to walk back up. The next person who walked in to care for the mother and the child and their ongoing needs wasn't so lucky. She gets popped in the back of the head. Because now all of our energy is up. We're going to execute the plan. Press the button. Get them in here. I'm going to kill me and you and them. But, you know, liars lie. I want to kill himself. He could have done that. When really what the plan was. The plan was to wreak chaos and kill. Why? Because of anger. Why? Well, what we're told and what we know is this idea of cheating on him, whether she did or not, is irrelevant. That's what he believed. And that overcame everything, that anger, resentment, and rage towards her propelled him to kill other people. A misguided. None of it should be guided towards anybody, but certainly not to those who help us. And then what do we know? We know that this flowers, unfortunately, walking down the hall, you see that body turn, you hear one shot, you hear a second shot. Where's that second shot hit? Right in the neck. A fatal, deadly spot, a fatal, deadly shot that she was never, ever going to survive. In fact, you saw in the video that they were trying to give her CPR right there, right down at the nurse's station. That's how fatal that was. What else do we know? Well, we know that somebody who had left, interestingly, the only conversation about this, had left a gun, allegedly, which is a bunch of nonsense I suggest to you from the evidence, a gun in somebody's bag. There was more to it than that. Because there's the ability, willingness, and the act of taking that clip out and putting some more projectiles in. Okay? Is that true? Yes. Why? What did he have with him? All these extra projectiles. Why? Well, if you go in there to kill, okay, you can't run out. The only problem is the whole escapade is wrong. Fortunately, there was a police officer right there who shot him. Okay. What else did we bring? We brought you evidence from Selena about being pistol whipped. We showed you the pictures. Then we did more than that. We did more than show you the pictures. We brought DNA evidence of the hair on the gun. We brought DNA evidence to prove this. We brought Emmys who told you how these people died, the angles, and all of it is consistent with what Selena said, what Officer Rangel said, what the scientific evidence shows, and it all brings it together that in this case, this is capital murder, and it's capital murder because as the judge tells you, a person commits the offense of capital murder. If he commits murder, as defined above, and the person murders more than one person, A, during the same criminal transaction. You got to hear and see from Officer Rangel's body worn camera the sounds, the time, the gunshots. You didn't get to see Jackie get shot, but you certainly saw Miss Flowers walk past that room in the wrong place at the wrong time. If only she had been one, two, three rooms away. Maybe on another floor, maybe on a break. The same thing for Jackie. Somebody would probably be dead, but maybe we'll be finding about these two. Because 
Like I said, I think it's painfully obvious and clear beyond a reasonable doubt that he was on a mission to kill. And he accomplished his mission. He got shot in the course of it, something he probably wasn't expecting to go and find a police officer just taking a police report on theft right down the hallway. And we have him here, and we brought you this case. And we're asking you to do what you told us you'd do. First of all, when we ask you to take that oath the judge did, you told us you were serious about it, you meant it, you were going to give us true answers. And we went over all kinds of things. Okay? We're counting on you. You stood up, you took an oath, and you said you were going to render a true verdict according to the law and the evidence to help you God. We trusted you, and we're counting on you. And what we're telling you is, our position on this case, the position that's proved beyond a reasonable doubt, is that this man, as I said, was walking resentment, rage, anger, with a plan to kill. And he took all of that into that place where new life, new birth, new hopes, new plans are the only things that are supposed to reside in that tower. And what he took in there was death two times. And you've heard all the evidence, cross-examination, replay the tape. You heard what he said. Not often do you get to come down here on jury duty and hear and see death distributed out in a random fashion like what he did. But unfortunately, there are those who will do it. And when you were sitting from here to there, whether you realize it or not or thought about it, you were sitting just that close to a murderer, a capital murderer, who shouldn't be played with, shouldn't be second guessed, and look at the facts and reach a reasonable conclusion. And based on these instructions, as I said, you read it, you should never go past capital murder. Because that's what the believable and credible evidence shows in this case. He's guilty of capital murder, and we're asking you to follow those instructions in your oath and find him guilty. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Your Good morning. Good morning. It's kind of like the way we started. It was a little bit better for him than me that last time. I thought I'd be saying good afternoon because you know how long we took when we went through Boyd Iron. So, uh, first thing I want to do is I want to thank you all. On behalf of Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Johnson, myself, thank you for taking the time out of your schedules. Uh, we know that it's difficult to come down here, leave your lives, and listen to cases like this. Uh, and we appreciate it, and we appreciate you doing your duty and sitting down here. And, and like Mr. Cruzo, we are going to rely on you, rely on the oath that you took to follow the law and the evidence and let it lead to the correct verdict. Obviously, we have a very strong disagreement with them on what the final outcome should be. But as Mr. Johnson said in his opening statement, we are not saying he's not guilty. That's not what you're here about. It's about determining to what level he is guilty. That's why during Board Dyer, I brought up with you the lesser included offenses, so that you would understand how the process worked and what you would be looking at. And we talked about, if you remember when the judge first case came in, and when I talked to you, I asked you, who came in here and thought, I wonder what he did? Now, when I asked it, nobody, asked it, nobody raised their hand, because she had already asked it and gone over it. That presumption of innocence that we were talking about goes throughout your deliberations as well. And you might be wondering, well, what does he mean by that? Well, if you go back and you look at page, it talks about when you're applying the, the law to things, it talks about your application in the presumption of innocence. And when you go down and if you have a reasonable doubt as to which offense, whether it's capital murder or murder, the presumption of innocence applies so that what you re will resolve that doubt with is a finding of the lesser included offense. That's, and I want you to know that because 
sometimes you think, well, presumption of innocence, that's gone. We've already passed that. We've presumed him innocent, and so now we can just know. That presumption goes through the rest of the case. When you're looking at the lesser included offenses, you still reserve that and use that to determine a lesser included offense as well, such that that doubt would be resolved in the defendant's favor. And that's very important to remember here because you're looking at a number of different possible verdicts on your behalf. So please keep that into consideration. The other thing that we talked about uh, was the burden of proof. We talked about the fact the state does the accusing, they have to do the proving. Which means a couple of things now. First off, it means what you've seen throughout. They get to start the case and they get to finish the case. Okay? Which means we'll get up here and we'll argue, and after we sit down, they still get to stand up and respond to that. Note. We would love to get up and respond to whatever they say. Keep in mind that for every argument they have, there's another argument to be made for the other side. What we're asking you to do is, as you took your oath to consider all the law and the evidence, is to give both sides a fair shot. Listen to the evidence, look at the evidence, apply it, and then come out with the proper verdict. That's the oath that you took, and that's the oath that we're holding you to. But realize, we would love to get up and respond, so we're going to have to rely on you all back there to think about what would the retort be? What would the defense come back and say to this? Doing that would give everyone a fair verdict in this case. We also talked about uh, communicate. Actually, we didn't talk about this. I want to talk about it briefly. Communication, the hardest thing for a juror to understand is how to communicate with the court. And it might seem simple. It might seem that you just send a note and, and that's it. Well, no, that's not quite it when you want to have testimony read back to you. There has to be a conflict with that person's testimony. You have to identify that conflict and that person and send a note out to the court with that information. That's the only way that the court reporter can then go and read back that information and it will be presented to you in a number of forms. It could be read back to you or it could be printed out and given to you. But unless you point out the conflict that you have, you will not get the response that you need. I want to point that out because most times that's an issue. You all want to hear what you want to hear. You need to know how to get that information, the proper way to get that information. And if you don't ask it properly, you'll get a note back that says you have all the law and evidence. Well, then you'll know, well, we didn't ask it properly. Okay? So keep that in mind. All right? Last thing I want to talk to you about is what I discussed during Board Hour was respecting everyone's decision. I talked to you about the fact that I picked out three jurors and I said, Two of you think he's guilty, one of you think he's not guilty. What would you do? Did you beat up on him? We talked about 12 angry men. We actually had one of the jurors, if you remember, that actually played a part in that, as a female played a part in that. I want to point that out because that's where you are now. You all are each entitled to, or required to deliberate, but you're each entitled to your own personal moral decision. If you've deliberated, and you've come to your own personal moral decision, you have an absolute right to stand by that decision. And you have a right to be respected by all 11 other members of the jury. You took an oath, and we discussed it for this very part right here. Each one of you is the exclusive triers of the fact. Okay? Each one of you, if this is a group that has to come to a unanimous decision, but each one of you is the exclusive judge of the triers of the fact. You make that determination. You do not have to be bullied. You don't have to accept it. And all of you promised me you would not let that happen. And you would stand by even those people who might have a contrary opinion to you. And we're going to hold you to that. Now, I want to come up here and talk to you about these brief aspects of the law. Mr. Johnson is going to come up and talk to you about how the law applies to the facts and give his uh, summation of the evidence that you saw. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate you giving Mr. Johnson the same attention you've given me. Thank you. Thank you, Court. Counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I too would like to thank you for the uh, time and the uh, attention you've given this case this week and the fact that you've taken time from your lives to sit here and have to listen to some uh, pretty brutal things here in the courtroom. A lot of these things, uh, it'll take you probably not days, but weeks or months. So to soften those things that you've seen and, and try to set them out of your mind. But we appreciate your being here and doing your job as jurors in this case. 
Uh, I, too, want to start off by talking to you about the uh, board hour process in this case, wherein you were selected to be the ones who hear the case. And I thought it was uh, a real good way that uh, Mr. Cruzo spoke to you in regards to the fact that we were talking about your being the judges in a case and whether or not you could sit in judgment on another individual. Mr. Cruzo told you to take your focus away from being an actual being in judgment of the defendant, but being in judgment of the case that they brought to you, because the question here in this case is have they brought you everything that you will have to have to give them the verdict that they are asking for? Now, I want to make sure that everybody understands something. When we started off this trial, we, we started talking to you about, well, it's capital murder, and they talked about that. No one really discussed anything about lesser offenses until Mr. Peel got up before you in the board hour process and told you that it may not just be capital murder that you consider. If you recall when I gave you my opening statement, I told you that I believe when you heard all of the evidence in this case that if you would keep an open mind throughout this process, the entire process, certain things may come to you to assist you and deciding the ultimate question is what exactly is this defendant guilty of? And I told you then that I thought he would be found guilty or that he should be found guilty of a lesser included offense, possibly murder. <coughs> now, just so that you know, because you're not down here every day, this is your day as a juror. You're not professional jurors. We are down here every day in the legal profession handling these cases and dealing with these issues, but you don't see those. So just because this case starts as a capital murder doesn't mean anything about where it should end. The ending point of a trial is decided by the jurors. And it is decided by the choices that the judge gives to you. And you see now that although when this case started the only thing discussed was capital murder, we see now that we have various destinations that you can arrive at in your deliberations of what you heard in this courtroom this week. It could be capital murder. It shouldn't, but it could. It could be murder. It could be manslaughter. It could be negligent homicide. Now, where do these come from? Well, they come from an understanding that the law gives us that you truly, a person should truly be held accountable for only that which was in his heart when he acted. The mental state. What was happening with that person and where did that person's mental state take him? You don't judge merely by the result of the conduct because if that was the case, all they would have to do is stand here before you, show the two deceased, put the autopsies on, and say, well, he, this is the result, this is what he caused, and so the verdict must be that. But it can't be. That's why we have trials. That's why we have trials. And they took on the responsibility in this case, repeatedly told you, they take that responsibility and they'll, they'll live with it. And I submit to you that they have failed to do that. Now, as I stand here before you folks, if you think that I, I mean, I, I would not stand here for a moment and argue that this defendant should be resolved of accountability for his actions. Absolutely not. But what is the appropriate verdict in the choices that you have before you? Capital murder. If you recall in Bordier, this case, when the judge finally told you what the defendant was charged with, she said it is capital murder, the highest charge in our land. Two punishments. Life or death. Life or death. And she told you that this case was not one involving an allegation or a request for a death sentence. So it still is life without the possibility of parole, the ultimate punishment in the case in our state. And folks, when you accuse somebody of the ultimate charge, jurors, if you do your job, if you truly do your job, you should judge them just like they asked to be judged. Did they bring you the ultimate proof? Can you honestly, and, and folks, you'll answer this question by your verdict, what can you honestly go back there and say has been proven to you beyond all 
doubt. All reasonable doubt is the standard. Now, Judge Crusoe gets up and he says, and he's got a narrative. I mean, you've seen where their narrative has, has taken them through what they believe the evidence has shown in this case. And as, as he stood here and eloquently painted this picture for you of a situation that was preordained and that he claims the defendant came into this situation that day with a heart bent on destruction, anger and rage, I think was the terms he continued to use, and that as he entered the hallway of the, of the hospital that day, that this was a preordained destination of events. That's his, that's his theory. That's his narrative. They have now asking you to judge that narrative. And I'm going to ask you to do that because I submit to you the evidence absolutely does not substantiate that. The evidence doesn't prove that this was an intent by Nestor Hernandez to walk in there and cause this destruction. Now, so let's talk about how could we be here? What brings us here today if it wasn't this preordained destination that the state is adopting as their narrative of this case? And folks, that's where it gets complicated. And you know why it gets complicated? Because life's complicated. Life's complicated. Life is complicated out there for everybody in this room. Life is complicated out there for Nestor Hernandez. People find themselves in situations and relationships with people. It's not all romantic comedies on the movies. It's real life. And in real life, in this particular case, we've got Selena Bellatora. And Nestor Hernandez, two people with lots of problems. Lots of problems and a long history between them. Drug use, criminality, cheating, lying. The whole host of things that go on between people that cause the friction and the issues that led to this particular situation. Was it a preordained destination? Or was it something that happened in the split of a moment? And, and, and think about it. Because as, as the judge told you, they, it's not always, they don't know if someone's going to testify. But we, our, our defendant got up there. He asked to get up there to tell his story to you, knowing that he would be judged by you, his credibility, knowing that you would look at his testimony in light of the other testimony that was before you from Selena Bellatora. And I submit to you folks that there was nothing about this day that was in, in the midst of all of the problems that they were having. And, and, and he got up there and told you, and I think you can see it, and I think it has the ring of truth to it, because as he described that relationship and told you, she wasn't even going to, she wasn't even going to let me be claimed to be the father. She's telling me that sometimes I'm not the father, other times I am. I know she's been cheating on me. I'm not 100% sure if it's even my baby. But he's talking about how he goes there that day and the day before. And she wasn't even going to let him take her to the hospital. Now, how do you think that's going to make a man feel? And folks, again, this isn't... I, I want to tell you these things to put in perspective what took place out there. So he takes her to the hospital. And one of the issues I think is important in this case, and you may not, you may disagree, you may think what I'm telling you is wrong. But again, does it not have the ring of truth? Because Selena Bellatore didn't really understand what importance it would have into the, into the picture later. But how would we have ever known that she was holding out that birth certificate over Nestor Hernandez's head? You get rid of that gun now, or your name's not going to be on there. And he told you that because of what she said, I told her, okay, fine. And I stuck it in her bag and carried it into that hospital. And, and, and you got to think about it. Is it this preordained destination? Or was it something that came together in a moment caused in part by Selena Bellator? And folks, again, I'm going to sit here because I believe that if you really examine the truth of this situation, there's a lot of this that got started that was started by, exacerbated by, Selena Bellator. 
interesting because see we know from as the, as the prosecution told you in board hour, they got to turn over all the evidence we can see what everybody said me on the day this all happened I asked Selene, when he gets in there, he's trying to talk to you, and what do you, you pulled the covers over your head and refused to talk to me, didn't you? Yeah. What do you, what do you think, folks? How, how's that going to make a person feel? Get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. And then you tell. And see, folks, let me ask you this, it, because this is a courtroom. This isn't scripted. This isn't television. Why is that important? Did the, did, what did the defendant tell you about her pulling the covers over her head? I really don't remember her doing it. Now, why is that important? Because it has the ring of truth to it. He gets there and he's in this situation that is getting worse by the moment. He says that I'm, at that point in time, we're, getting, we're arguing. She's telling me to get out. I get the gun. We start arguing. And as Miss Pakua comes in the room, she starts getting up and saying, well, I'm going I'm, I'm to do this. And she grabs her phone and starts to walk. Take a couple steps is exactly what he said, away from the bed. And then he walked around to get over there. And when she said, I want him out of here, what did he do? What did he tell you? I started to hit her. Folks, I believe that the evidence in this case shows that that is what is reasonable that took place. Not this preordained thought that he was wanting to kill everybody. And whatever Selena Bellator's story is now about, oh, I'm going to kill everybody that walks in the room. If that was really how he felt, folks, she would have been dead. She would have been dead if that was his ultimate goal. If this was a capital murder, she would have died on the spot. But he says, no, I hit her. I slapped her, and then I tried to hit her with the gun, and while we were going, the gun goes off. He said he couldn't, he didn't even know Miss Pakua had been hit at first. Did you hear how he described it to you? After the gun goes off, she was, she was leaning. She didn't even fall immediately. That's from his perspective. That's what he told you in the witness stand. Now, folks, let's, I'm going to stop here. Right when I, when, as I talk about the testimony of my client in this case, I want to, I want to remind you of something. Okay? Going back again to what was said by not only the court, not only by the prosecution, but also by co-counsel. They have a burden of proof. We have none. When the defendant get up, got up there and testified, I'm going to tell you as I stand here right now, in order to find the defendant guilty of a lesser offense, you don't have to believe everything he told you. You don't have to believe everything he told you. The question is whether or not it causes you to have a reasonable doubt about what they charged him with. And they charged him with the ultimate case. And for it to come together for him, they have to have ultimate proof. I submit to you the things that the defendant told you. The gun went off. I had no intention of harming her. I had no intention of shooting her. I didn't want to do that. I was trying to hit this girl upside the head because of the way she was treating me. Folks, that, that has the ring of truth. Can you honestly go back there and say that that did not happen? Can you honestly go back there and say it didn't happen? And if the truth, when you ask yourself that question is, as far as Miss Pakua goes, I don't know. Because he, he went on to describe as to how he went over and he's opened the door and he just starts shooting out the door. Which caused, we know, ended up causing the death of, of Katie Flowers. But the situation at that point in time is crazy. It's crazy. It's out of control. And then we know the next time he steps out, he gets shot. And that's when all this screaming and things take place. But you've got to understand you can't take one moment and, and then go backwards and say that because of what he's screaming here, he must have felt differently here. That doesn't make sense. If his plan was to kill people, he would have walked in there and started shooting right from the start. That's where their case fails because in order to get the ultimate crime, they got to convince you that this was what he was wanting all along. And they can't do that. Not based on this testimony. 
The court's charge tells you, look at the mental states. Mental states. Was the killing of, of Miss Pakula knowingly and intentionally, or was it reckless? Was it done while he is trying to admittedly hit the mother of his child with a gun in a hospital? And see, folks, and the whole situation is ridiculous. And as I stand here and argue, I, I, I know you guys look out here and you see this courtroom full of good folks, good people. And, and, and I know that you have pressure to come back and do what you feel they want you to do. But that's not your job here. Your job is to do what's right. Your job's not to do the easy thing. Your job is to do the hard thing. And that is go back and analyze this evidence. Can you honestly say he was intentionally acting when Miss Pakula got shot? And I submit to you that you can't. And Selena Villatora, her version of what she says happened out there is certainly, I submit to you, colored by the fact that she knows it was her own actions which started this tragedy. Think about it. If you were the one doing things that caused somebody to go to, to, to do acts that caused this kind of carnage, would you not try to soften the blow to yourself and those around you? by deflecting the blame, which I submit to you is what she's done here. You have these choices. Was it knowingly and intentionally? Did, did he say at the moment Miss Pakula was shot, I want to shoot her, I want to kill her? Did they prove that to you? In light of all the factors, I submit to you that it's just as reasonable that as he told you, it was reckless while he was trying to beat his wife or his girlfriend with that pistol. Those go down to the issues of murder. Goes to the issue of manslaughter. Okay? Because if you believe that maybe you don't know about Miss Pakua for sure because there's parts of this evidence that doesn't sit well with you or that causes you to only have a reasonable doubt. Not to get up there and say, well, I believe every word of what he told me. That's not the law. We don't have to. You don't have to believe him. You just have to go back there and ask yourself, do I have a reasonable doubt, truthfully? And if I do, do I have the moral fortitude and the courage to do the right thing? And not only the right thing, but what I swore to this court prior to this testimony starting that I would do. Is it reckless? I submit to you it was and if you find it to be reckless, then the proper verdict in this case is a verdict of guilty to manslaughter. To manslaughter. Now, you go back there and look at it. It also gives you a choice to find whether or not you believe it to be criminally negligent homicide. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to agree. I will agree with the, with the prosecution if they get up here and say, Ms. Johnson has to be crazy to argue that. And, and, and truthfully, I think it might have to be. Because to get to criminally negligent homicide, I think you'd pretty much have to believe the defendant. Have to believe everything he told you. You'd have to feel comfortable going up and, 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 and saying, I'm basing this verdict on everything he told me. Now, you may not be able to do that. But I submit if you do your job, the things that he told you will cause you to have a, definitely a reasonable doubt about Captain Murphy. <laughs> In this charge, folks, you have lots of choices. Capital murder. I submit to you, you really only have three. Capital murder, murder, and manslaughter. Naked and homicide might be a stretch. But I'm going to tell you, when you go back there, before you vote on anything, reread this charge. If all of you want a copy of the charge, send out a note. We'll try to get you everybody can have their own copy. You can read it, discuss it together. But make sure you understand what you're deciding when you go back there. Because you're going to find that in all of these choices, every single choice that you have, you're going to have a paragraph between one, one charge and the next, from capital murder to murder, from murder to manslaughter, from manslaughter to negligent homicide. In every one of those choices, the court's going to give you an instruction that reads basically this right here. If you believe from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of either the murder of Jacqueline Pacour, the murder of Katie Flowers, or manslaughter, or manslaughter of Katie Flowers, 
And here's the language between every choice you have. But you have a reasonable doubt as to which of these set offenses he is guilty. Then you must resolve that doubt in the defendant's favor and find him guilty of the lesser offense. Okay? That's in every choice that you have. And folks, like I said, you know, you've heard this thing. And, and as I told you in opening statement, all I could ask for you to do is keep an open mind. And I know that there's not a person in this room that, that wants to do anything that could be perceived as in Mr. Hernandez's favor after the heartbreak and hardship that he's caused all these folks. But you remember when I first stood up here a few minutes ago, I told you, justice is when you find somebody guilty for what he actually did. They haven't come in here and proven that he intentionally came in there and killed two people. They haven't done that. It'd be easy for you to go back there and do it. But I'm going to trust that you're not going to do the easy thing. Go back there and read this charge. Read this charge. And folks, when you read it and you apply your common sense, when you go back there and, and if anybody says, well, wait a second, I, there's parts about what Nestor said I didn't believe, go back there and think. Just the way he was phrasing certain things, the way he was describing certain things to you, the way things were making him feel. Even though none of you could imagine possibly the horror and the harm that he caused, I submit to you, every one of you could sit there and for at, at certain times go, I think I know how he was feeling. Now, when it led to this carnage, it was wrong. Mr. Hernandez is going to pay for his crime, but he should pay for only that crime which he is guilty of committing. Folks, I'm going to sit down. Mr. Lewis gets up. As Mr. Peel just told you, I don't get a chance to get up and respond. Don't worry. He may, he may get up and say, well, hey, Mr. Johnson, he's over there screaming about this, but he didn't mention this. I'll guarantee you, there ain't nothing he's going to say to you that I couldn't respond to if I was given an opportunity. I don't know exactly what he was gonna, he's going to about to tell you because I went over and tried to look at his notes early and he turned his pad upside down. So I'm sitting here guessing what he's going to say also. But I'm going to ask you guys to do this. Because this is the ultimate allegation. I want you to give the defendant the ultimate presumption of innocence. And if Mr. Lewis makes a point that I haven't addressed, when you're back there to deliberate, I would like for somebody to stand up and say, what might Mr. Johnson's have response have been to that point if he had been given a chance? Because I can promise you, folks, what I have told you here from the heart is what we, you, all of us in this courtroom have seen this week. And if you don't believe that this case meets the ultimate definition, not for retribution, because if we were talking retribution in this courtroom today, capital murder would be the easy and quick verdict. If we're talking about justice, the defendant will be found guilty for what he is guilty of, and that is a lesser offense from capital murder. And I'm going to ask you to take your time to think about it, but before you ever vote, make sure you read the language where the court tells you. If you believe he's guilty of something, but you're not sure beyond a reasonable doubt what it is, you must resolve it in his favor. That's the appropriate thing. Follow your oaths, follow the law, follow the facts, and return a verdict that is justice and not revenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, If you can give me a three-minute warning. Thank you. Before you start my time, can you give me one moment to set up the photograph? Thank you. Here's the approach. Yes.
May it please the court, counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. Good morning. So we spent the last couple of days talking about the heinous acts of this defendant, Nestor Hernandez, and the absolute havoc that he caused at Methodist Hospital on October 22, 2022. But I want to take this moment, just for a few moments, to remember and focus on these victims. Jacqueline, Jackie, Bakula, Katie, and Ned Flowers. That's what this case is about. They had family, they had friends, they had co-workers that loved them. They were doing what they loved to do on that day, helping others, being public servants. Jackie, social worker, Annette, being a nurse, helping mothers and their babies, doing what they loved to do when they were viciously, deliberately, and intentionally cut down and murdered by this man, Nestor Hernandez. So as we review the evidence in this case, in this closing argument, and when you go back to deliberate on this case, I want you to remember them. Remember them, Jackie and Annette. So let's talk about the credible evidence in this case. Let's start with Selena Villatoro. She's not an angel. She's not a saint. And she's honest with you on that stand.
first bang, and then you heard a thud. That is the body of Jacqueline Pakua hitting the ground. Disproving what he says that she didn't fall. You heard it yourselves just then. He goes through the door. He claims he's not looking. You can look at that video and tell he's pointing his gun. He raises it, points, and fires. Not once, but twice. Bang, bang. You see Annette standing right in front of that door. There is no way possible that he did not see her when he fired that gun. Not once, but twice. Okay, so what did, more credible evidence, what did Sergeant Von Hill tell you? Well, even before that, Selena says he reloaded the gun. Oh, I didn't intend to hurt anybody. I didn't intend to do anything with that gun. Really? You got a gun in your pocket, not only the gun, but you bought some extra bullets as well. Extra bullets. A box of bullets sitting there in that room. See, the credible evidence is starting to pile up. He wants to sit up here and say that this defendant shouldn't be absolved of his responsibility, but then he lays it out on Selena? Really? Sergeant Ron Hale, what's he tell you? He hears the shots, he responds. Thankfully, he wasn't hit because he was standing right to admit. He retreats, he calls for help. At that moment in time, the defendant comes outside of the room with the gun still in his hand. And he is forced to fire to protect not only himself, but others. Because as Selena told you, he was hell-bent on killing more people. Press the button. Push the button. Nah, she refused to do it. He was trying to get somebody else in that room to kill him. Sergeant Ron Hill, like I said in my opening statement, thank God he was there because he definitely saved additional lives that day. And how did you know that the defendant tried to come out of that room? That's the bullet that Sergeant Ron Hill fired. Went right through his leg and lodged into the wall. That's how you know he tried to come out that room. Plus, you saw the video of him trying to come out as well. Incredible evidence. And uh, All right, let's get to the defendant's statement. I'm not going to waste my time, waste your time, talking about this whole back and forth with Selena, the cheating, the STDs, and him not believing the baby was his because you have his medical records in evidence, no mention of any STDs. You also have the DNA test proving he's the father. Let's not waste our time with that. He wants you to believe that he goes into the room and with his word, they begin to tussle. Him and Selena. Selena, who had a baby the day before, not only had a baby, she had surgery. She had a C-section. She told us that she was in a, a lot of pain. But he wants you to believe that they're in there slapping and, and fighting each other. Not only is she in pain from the C-section, as you saw on multiple body cams, she's hooked to an IV. She can't move around like that. But he wants you to believe that he's in there fighting with her and she's the aggressor. It's not credible. So in the course of that, they're tussling, as he says. He pulls out the gun by his own admission he says, my finger wasn't even on the trigger. Okay. So he walks towards Selena. He begins, by his own admission again, striking her with the gun. And in the course of trying to strike her again in the head, Jackie walks between them. Okay, we know that that's not critical. Who in their right mind is going to try to stop a fight with somebody with a gun? But that's what he wants you to believe. And during the course of trying to strike Selena, he accidentally discharges the gun. He accidentally puts a hole directly in the back of her head. That was an accidental shot? No, sir. The evidence shows that this was a deliberate kill shot, just like Selena said. Deliberate. And then he fires out the door. And he shoots Annette. 
Oh, I wasn't even looking. Okay, you weren't looking, but you caused that shot right there directly to her face? And you shot two times? But you didn't intend to hurt anybody. Okay, sir. Stippling. What did the Emmy tell you about the stippling? That is burnt gunpowder. You only see that between three and five feet. Close range. All over her face. Credible evidence. Adding up. Adding up. yesterday that after he accidentally shot these women that he was looking for help. No, he wasn't looking for help. He's talking about he's got a hostage. He's refusing to come out of the room. No, ain't no working shit out. Y'all already know what time it is. I'm talking about a plan. The DA is right. He had a plan. He intended to go there to commit murder. Multiple murders. The defense attorney talks about, well, this, this evidence doesn't show a plan. We actually don't have to prove a plan to you. All we have to prove is that he intentionally and normally killed both victims during the same criminal transaction. But the evidence, the credible evidence here shows that he had a plan. And let's just be honest about this. At the end of the day, this man is a coward. He's a coward. He's talking about we're going to die today. Nah. Some other people are going to die. Now, I would agree with Mr. Johnson on this, that Selena and his relationship, that's a toxic relationship. They were extremely troubled. I agree with him on that. But their trouble... Hey, so again, uh, please, 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 He brought their drama to these women. They didn't have anything to do with that, which shows that he is a coward. He killed, intentionally and knowingly killed, two totally innocent victims. He told you that himself. These women were innocent. They didn't have anything to do with that drama and that mess that he was on that day. Yet here we are. Here we are. The overwhelming, incredible evidence shows that this defendant, Nestor Hernandez, intentionally and knowingly killed Jacqueline, Jackie, Pakula, Katie, and that Flowers on October 22nd, 2022. And I just want to close with this, going back to the jury's charge, bottom of pages four and five. In order for you to even go to the lessers, and I agree with the DA, you're not going to make it there. You're not going to make it to those lessers. But in order for you to make it there, you have to all agree, all 12 of you have to agree that he is not guilty of capital murder. You all have to be unanimous on that. So if there's one person sitting back there saying that he is guilty of capital murder, hold to your convictions. Don't waver. 
Again, the evidence in this case is so very overwhelming. I don't anticipate that you will take very long with your verdict. But again, I ask that you keep these women in your mind as you deliberate on this case. Think about their families. Think about their friends. Think about their coworkers, the people that love them. You speak not only for those people, you speak for this community when you tell him that he's guilty of capital murder and that we're not going to tolerate this kind of foolishness and violence here in Dallas County. I submit to you that the only just and right verdict in this case is guilty of capital murder, and we will await that verdict. Thank you. Thank you, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you now have all the evidence in this case. You have the argument of the counsel. You also have the court's charge. However, it's lunchtime. And so I'm going to release you for an hour's lunch. You will return at 1.45. And when you're all gathered in the jury room, please push the red button so we know that you're all there. And at that time, the court will give you the charge and other documents, relevant documents. Your first order of duty will be to select a presiding juror, and you'll have the form here, okay? You're still under my instructions. As you're at lunch, do not discuss with each other. Do not do any research. Do not discuss with anybody else. You are only to deliberate when all 12 of you are in the jury room. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am. All right. The alternate jurors will be led to a separate room where they will uh, stay uh, throughout the deliberations unless something happens with one of the supplanted jurors. Uh, they will Otherwise, uh, please do not go contrary to any of the instructions that I've given you. We do not want to miss trial in this case. Um, and as I said, push the red button so all of you are present. If you need a break, push the red button and the bailiff will come and attend to you. Okay? All right. See you at one forty-five. All right.
Can I put it back? Thank you very much. please. Both sides have. I'm, I'm oh, proud of what you all can bring out. The best in the world. Never know. I say, just to give me the same guy for you. That's Miss Penelope. Okay. I think that's Miss Wallace. Everybody needs to settle down quickly so we don't keep the jury waiting. Let's bring the defendant out.
All right. Let's line up the jurors. Please be seated. All right, we're on the record. Let the record reflect that the defendant is present with his attorneys, the state is present, the jurors are present and seated. Uh, would the presiding juror, uh, Ms. Kitchen, raise her hand for me? M Mr., I'm sorry. All right. Has the jury arrived at a verdict? We have. Is the verdict <coughs> unanimous? Yes, it is. All right. I will proceed to read the verdict. If the defense will stand for me. In the state of Texas versus Nestor Hernandez, we, the jury, unanimously find the defendant guilty of the offense of capital murder as charged in the indictment. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> please raise your hand if that is your verdict. <coughs> All right. Let the record reflect that the verdict is unanimous. Does either side wish to further poll the jury? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Y'all can sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> that ends your service on this case. Having found the defendant guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment, it now falls on me to assess punishment. So I'm going to release you back into the jury room. Um, you can talk to each other if you want, discuss your verdict with anybody of your choice, because you are no longer under my rule and I'm discharging you from your service. If you want, you can come back into the courtroom as members of the public. You can also wait in the jury room um, if you want to talk to either of the parties, the, uh, the attorneys, okay? And I'll address you shortly. So I'm going to discharge you at this time. Thank you. All rise. <laughs>
Please be seated. All right, if y'all will give me a few minutes, I'd like to go in and address the jurors. Sure. Thank you. And if she says no, I'll just give yeah, it from over there. I'm not sure. Really. Yeah, but we'll, we'll ask. Okay. okay. If you don't mind, you can ask this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I don't know what's asking about. No comment. No 
Does Mr. Johnson step out? He told me to tell you that you need to go ahead. I can. I can Okay. Trust him with this part. <laughs> All right, that's where the defendant. Well, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to need the trial court certification of the defendant's right. Oh, I'm Is sorry, Jared. I'll grab that. Yeah, I've got the notice, the other notice that they have. All right, Mr. Hernandez um, was just found guilty of the first degree uh, capital murder case. And Mr. Hernandez, I'm not going to impose punishment. But before I do that, counsel, is there any legal reason uh, why sentence should not be imposed? No reason at all, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Hernandez. I'm assessing your punishment at life in prison without the possibility of parole. I'm not assessing a fine at this time. It's the judgment and decree of this court that you be taken by the sheriff and handed over to the institutional division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, where you shall serve this sentence until this sentence is discharged. The sentence starts today, okay? Now, this was not a plea bargain agreement. This was not an agreement between you and the state. This was a trial, so you do retain uh, your right to appeal this sentence, okay? And the judgment. And I've handed you a copy of the trial court certification of your right of appeal, which explains this to you, okay? Um, do you understand that document? I know your attorney 
explain it to you and had you sign it. Do you understand your rights, your appellate rights? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm also going to make an affirmative finding that a deadly weapon to which uh, to which a firearm was used or exhibited during the commission of this offense. Um, even though it doesn't really make any difference to this uh, sentence. Is there victim impact? Yes, Your Honor, we had five from the Brown family, and then I have one brief written one from the cool family because nobody could be here today. Okay. All right, that will be off the record. That concludes this hand. No approach. Let me start briefly, Your Honor. What's the question? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> The jury having found the defendant guilty of capital murder and the uh, court having assessed punishment at life in prison without the possibility of parole, the family, um, friends, and the victims, um, yeah, the victim's family has the right to make uh, victim impact statements. Um, the public and the defendants are not to make any derogatory comments facial expressions um, or bodily movements. Uh, this is the victim's family's time uh, to state how they feel and we need to afford them that respect. Does everybody understand? Yes. All right, thank you. Go ahead. All right, were you all going to do it one at a time, or I thought it was in a, in a, group, in a group? We just wanted to stand as a group, but we're going to, we have individual okay. statements. That's fine. Thank you. As Annette's niece, your actions have completely shattered my heart. As a nurse, it pisses me off. Annette devoted her life to taking care of people, just like Jackie did. Everyone in healthcare does. We vow to serve others, even scum like you. After you wrecked havoc that day and stole two beautiful so souls who undoubtedly were better human beings and more deserving of life than you will ever be, they still saved your life. I hope every day for the rest of your miserable life, you are haunted by their names, faces, and the legacy that you cut short. Although you don't care about any of that, you've shown no remorse for anything. What if someone had done this to your mother? Imagine having your heart ripped out of your chest. That's what you did to all of us. We had to sit here and look at pictures and watch video of you violently murdering women that you don't even deserve to breathe the same air as. I noticed that you didn't even look up during the autopsy photos. That again shows what kind of a coward you are. You act hard and like you're bad. 
but you are nothing but a loser who is never going to amount to anything other than a mistake that your mother made the day she had she birthed you. Your mother will have to live the rest of her life knowing what you did, and I hope that haunts you. It probably won't because you obviously care nothing about anyone else other than yourself. I hope that that little boy who unfortunately has to share your DNA never grows up to know what a waste of human space you are. I pray that he lives a life full of love and happiness, a life that you would never have given him. Jackie and Annette will live on in me, our families, and every single healthcare worker that will continue to serve others in their honor. You will rot in a prison cell until hopefully you suffer a long and drawn out painful death and face the hell that you have coming. I'll continue to live and work and serve, serve others. I will be the best nurse that I can possibly be, and I'll continue to live a life full of happiness, love, and grace. I'll make memories with my family and my friends. You, however, however will live your days in a prison cell where your short, fat self will undoubtedly be made someone else's special friend where every day they will have their way with you. Unfortunately for them, if the photos of your toddler-sized shoes have anything to say with it, they will be disappointed. Rod in hell. What's your step? Yeah. <laughs> As my mother, I loved taking care of other people, so I professionally raised babies for 12 years. <laughs> I appreciate your concern. Okay. Hmm. Firstly, I would like to everyone notice that this jacket is no longer just a jacket. This jacket is the loudest respect I was allowed to show my mama and Jackie Pakua. This jacket was worn by my mama for too many years, doing the very thing that cost her her life, her job. This jacket somehow, some way, just so happened to be the very color that Jackie wore doing the same exact thing, her job. I lost my mama because she cared more about your son than you did. You don't care about any of this, like my girl said. If you did, we wouldn't be here in the first place. All of this show here is for them. My mother, Annette Flowers, Jackie Pakua, every healthcare professional across the globe. They do not deserve, nor should they ever have to worry about their safety going into work every day. They're the last community that should have that. My mom, above all else, by choice was just that, a mom. She was a superwoman to say the least. Single mom that raised four kids on her own, working full time, always making sure we felt loved and supported. And I'm beyond blessed that I was raised by a woman who was able to be an adult, show up for her children, her friends, her coworkers, her patients, and anyone with an earshot that needed her or just to borrow a little bit of her power. There's nothing I can say to you. It doesn't matter. You're never going to care. But we all show today who she was and have this entire week by the strength that we have had to show and put on ourselves. All for what? You couldn't control yourself for one hour, two hours, however long you were allowed to be in that hospital. You couldn't walk away. We had to sit there and watch you cry for your mommy after we sat here and watched over and over again how you made sure we will never be able to do that again. I have nothing else to say. Thank you. Thank you. I'm and it's what
oldest granddaughter. I was 14 when you murdered her. 14 years old. I had to endure the trauma of her being murdered. A middle schooler listening to the detectives describe how you killed her. And now I'm 15, having to relive it again this week. I haven't gone a night without thinking about her. I break down randomly in school and I have to leave class to collect myself. I cry myself to sleep most nights, wondering how someone could do something so cruel and you don't even care. How is it possible to be so selfish that you take someone's life? The first few month, months after the murder were unreal. I would leave my house and everything would be a blur. I would be in class one minute and sobbing in the counselor's office the next. I couldn't handle the fact that she was gone. We had to go to her house the day it happened to meet with the detectives and I couldn't even look at her room. Her covers lying on the bed that she was laying peacefully in not even 12 hours ago. She was one of the most important people in my life. I was with her in Austin a week before she died. She was supposed to be here for so many parts of my life, as your son should be in yours. She never got to see me make high school cheer and I wouldn't have done it without her. She was the person I needed to thank the most. She went to every volleyball game that she could be at. She was always there cheering me on. She doesn't know that I made the high school team and she didn't get to see my tears of joy when I found out. She always told me to follow my dreams and when I told her I wanted to be a lawyer, she was so happy. She always told me about the strength that I'll have to have and the work and the hours that I'll have to put in. She didn't get to see me walk the stage when I was inducted into the college program at my high school where I'm studying criminal justice. She doesn't get to see me graduate high school and she didn't even get to see my little sister graduate kindergarten. Anytime I think of any of my accomplishments, I'm in tears. Not tears of joy, but tears of sorrow because she didn't get to see any of them. I miss her more than words can describe and the fact that she died tra so traumatically messed me up in a way that I don't know if I can recover from. My perception of the world is completely shattered. I'm, I'm always on edge, scared something's going to happen to me. I miss the girl I was before. I was just a normal teenage girl who wasn't worried about someone coming to a place where I should be completely safe taking my life. And it makes me sick that you can come up here and give your testimony with absolutely no remorse in your voice. The only thing that you were worried about was the fact that she cheated on you. I had nothing else to say. Thank you. Oh, hello, I'm Annette's oldest daughter. Uh, I cannot even begin to express the feelings I'm having today and standing or sitting here, having to relive this nightmare of losing my mom. Not only losing my mom, but hearing the awful details of her tragic death. But I'm gonna try my best for my mother. If you knew my mom, you would know she was an angel on earth. She lived for her kids, she lived for her grandkids, and she lived for her patients. You know, the ones that she was caring for the day her life was tragically taken by someone who doesn't even deserve to be breathing the same air as the families in this room. It takes a special person to be a nurse, patient and kind, generous with their time. When we were younger, my mom had four kids at home that she was raising alone. She never once complained about how long and many hours she spent at the hospital away from her kids. Her heart was entirely into her career, which showed daily with every mommy and baby she cared for. She also valued the time she spent outside her long hours at the hospital. Being a single mother is not for the weak, especially with the four of us. <laughs> Some years we would have to get up at 2 a.m. on Christmas mornings to open gifts before she had to be at a 12, 12 hour Christmas day shift at the hospital, pretty much every other year. She had a heart of gold. She was such a selfless person. Here I am before all of you, a mother myself, having to speak about the vicious murder of mine. It feels unreal. At 38, I still need my mother. She was, on, she was my only parent. I still want to call her every day and ask her questions about cooking or weird health 
if symptoms that my kids or I might be having, questions about my childhood, but I can't. All the while, this monster was shouting out, call my mom, while he was being taken into custody. Lucky for him, he can still do that. Unfortunately for me, my sisters, my brother, my kids, we can't ever again. My 15-year-old daughter just spoke and gave her statement, but my youngest was only five years old when you took her, took her granny from her. Luckily, we have more than enough good memories that we'll be able to keep alive in her going forward so she can feel the immense amount of love her granny had for her. But still, her own earliest memories of her Grammy will always and only be the horrific story and trauma of her Grammy's death. By the hands of someone who should have never had the chance to even set foot in the hospital at all, much less have access to a gun in a hospital on what should be the safest department of the entire hospital. I want to thank everyone here and those who couldn't be here for the outpouring love and support you've given my family and me at this time. I also want to take this moment to grieve with Jacqueline Pakua's loved ones and offer my sincere condolences to them. The death of our loved ones, these hospital workers, was not in vain. They left an impact on this world and they will continue to leave a mark on all through the patients they served and cared for and through the improved safety of nurses around the world. Thank you. Uh, Stacy, do you have a box of the clinics there? Kleenex? Annette Flowers' youngest daughter. I have been in an utter loss of words while trying to describe the way what you did affected me. It has affected every single aspect of my life. I'm also only 30 years old, the exact same age you were when you took her. And now just entering the real years of adulthood, looking at buying a house, starting a new career, and finding the person I want to spend my life with. You took the one person I'm supposed to be able to go to for all my life questions, my mom. While I hope your mom never speaks to you again, and in fact, it appears she is not here to support you now, I don't even get that option anymore. There are still times to this day that I will need my mom and I'll go to text her or call her and the reality hits me all over again. I don't get to share any more special moments with my mom because of you. I didn't get to introduce her to the wonderful man that treats me exactly how she always hoped someone would, someone who's an actual man. I didn't get to take her on the trips I planned and make more everlasting memories with my mom. She doesn't get to see me build a life for myself and she won't get to walk me down, down the aisle at my wedding. I've never felt so alone on this earth than the day that you murdered her and every day since. A part of me died with her that day. I don't understand why anyone would bring a gun into a hospital surrounded by the most vulnerable people on earth where new mothers are learning how to take care of their brand new life that they created with your own child. You don't bring a gun into a hospital unless you have the intention of doing what you did. You didn't bring pepper spray, a taser, or anything else that is for self-defense without costing someone their life. You brought a weapon that does nothing but take someone's life. I'm now terrified anytime I see a gun in public. I grew up running the halls of Mesquite Community Hospital and now I'm scared of hospitals. I recently had a serious heart event due to the stress of what you did, but I was too scared to even go to a hospital. It took me hours to finally make it to an urgent care and you did that to me. I just can't comprehend what kind of monster you have to be to not only abuse the mother of your own child, but then take the lives of two mothers from their children all within one hour. The absolute disregard for anyone besides yourself is disgusting, and as George already said, you are a coward. She was the only parent I had, and now I have none because of you 
and you deserve far more, but you deserve nothing than life, less than life in prison. Thank you. All right, I'd like to thank everyone in the courtroom, uh, the members of the... Oh, you still have these? All right, very well. Okay, y'all can sit down. I'm sorry, I didn't even talk about that. Go ahead, that's fine. I was just going to say there's nobody that could be here today because they're out of town, uh, but I was emailed one by her brother, uh, Michael Oduro, so if I can read that. Yes, go ahead. On the 22nd of October 2022, Jacqueline had left home to the Methodist Hospital to do her job, a job she loved because of her gentle and kind heart, serving people along her profession, Social work was her passion, and she did this every day with love for those she had the opportunity to serve. On the 22nd of October, she couldn't go home to her son, Nigel, and Nigel and Jacqueline's family will never uh, see her again because she had been shot and killed by Nestor Hernandez, a man she had never seen before. The senseless and cruel killing of Jacqueline only demonstrates thorough disregard for human life by the man, Nestor Hernandez. Without a thought or care in the world, he killed Nigel's mom, our sister, our auntie, and a wonderful person. Throughout the trial, and particularly as he testified, we struggled to find some remorse from this man, some regret, and perhaps some sorrow, even if it was in hindsight. But we found none. All we saw was a heartless man who feels no remorse for the pain he has caused, whose only interest was to create a scenario that this senseless killing was out of some confusion and frustration he experienced at that time. This man, Nestor Hernandez, is a man who just wants to get off the hook. Our pain is deep, and we cannot grieve sufficiently for Jacqueline's death. We think of Nigel, her son, 13 years old, and we pray to God that in his goodness and mercy, he himself will be Nigel's guide. We pray for justice for Jacqueline's murder. We seek justice for the citizen's killing, punishment that fits the crime, so help us God. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who's in the courtroom, members of the public, uh, the victims' families. Thank you very much for remaining calm uh, throughout the proceedings. It's been a, a difficult week, um, and I hope somehow that you can get closure um, from this tragedy. Uh, but thank you for your grace, and I uh, wish you all well. All right. Thank you. Come on.